Dead horses, sir. Go see. Riders coming in, sir. <laughs> God, sir, we are damn glad to see you. Have you seen Custer? We've had no word from him since Sunday afternoon when he left us and rode off with five companies. I believe Custer's command has been defeated. Oh, that's hard to believe. I think Custer's somewhere down the big horn and grazing his horses. You are wrong, Captain Benteen. Where might he have fallen, sir? Permission to go, sir. Go. What happened to your Captain Benteen? Mistakes were made. I always called him by his baby name, Audie. He was the first child of a second marriage six years older than his brother, Tom. Audie! We must hurry! None of his brothers could pronounce Armstrong when they were boys, so they called him Audie. Audie, I'm going ahead without you. It will wait for me. My name is Elizabeth Custer. You need a new uniform. I thought the 7th Cavalry would be receiving them by now. The world does not know that the 7th Cavalry even exists. Uniforms would be too much to hope for. My husband was a great hero of the Civil War. He was at least surrender at Appomattox. He was daring and dashing. The youngest brevet major general in the history of the army at age 23. He captured the imagination of the whole country. The 7th Cavalry had been organized in the years following the rebellion. Oh, 
homesteaders, the miners, and the Kansas Pacific Railroad all were moving America west. The regiment was formed to protect them from the Indians. Arrangements had been made with the tribes by this time, but the feeling on the frontier was that no Indian had any rights that a white man was obligated to respect. The general was not pleased at the time with his assignment. The plains were considered the great American desert. My husband was a hero. He wanted Washington. I married the man in 1864. We had 12 years together. I adored him. I was very young the first time I saw him. He sat on his horse. He had a large nose, deep-set blue eyes, and light hair that was long and wavy. Cheyenne women talked of him as being a fine-looking man. My name on the agency roll is Kate Bighead. I was born when my people were in camp on the Geese River. I spent my childhood with the Southern Cheyenne. Through almost 40 years, many a time I thought of that handsome man I first saw in the South. We Cheyenne called him Hayetzi, long hair. The Arikara called him creeping panther who comes in the night. The Crow called him son of the morning star who attacks at dawn. I remember him. I saw him die. was called Curly as a child. In his 14th year, he watched helpless as soldiers killed one of his relatives for taking a cow. In his misery and confusion, he had a vision. A warrior rode out of the lake. He seemed to float on the ground while riding his horse. The warrior carried no scalps. His unbound hair hung below his waist, and he wore a smooth brown pebble behind one ear. The warrior's body had been decorated with hail spots. 
and a streak of lightning ran from his forehead to his chin. Bullets and arrows attacked him, but fell away without touching. A storm broke, yet he passed through unharmed. His own people clutched at him, trying to pull him down. But he rode through them. A red-backed hawk flew above his head. The vision faded. That boy's name was changed to Crazy Horse. From that time on, he felt destined to protect his people from the white man. The white people had been moving west for years, building, cutting roads, pushing the Indians before them. By 1866, barely an Indian nation in America was living on the land we was born to. The Indians did not intend to move further. Stinking savages! Stinking savages! Lily! Help me! Stay Help me! Help me! Help Hold up! Stinking savages! called it the Fetterman Massacre, after the officer who swore that with 80 men he could wipe out the entire Sioux nation. It was no massacre. Them soldiers were stupid, and they rode to their deaths. of the Fetterman Massacre was carried east. It was said that the heads were crumbled, brains were left to freeze on the rocks. Bitter feelings were awakened and the government was implored to punish the Indians. The order the army received was this. We must act with vindictive earnestness against the Sioux, even to their extermination. Men, women, and children. Colonel, give me a hand. General. Colonel Custer, sir. I'm awake. Hey, company, saddle up. The plains, Indian the war, plains had Indian begun. war had begun. The war with the Indians for me would end ten years later. On that hill they call Custer's Last Stand. They call it Custer's Last Stand. But it was not his. It would be our last stand. They have fled. They are cowards. And you will pursue them, Colonel Custer. And are we pleased to have you finish and kill every last bloody red savage on these plains? Yes, General.
7th Cavalry crisscrossed the plains that summer. It was a new kind of war, fought in wide open, empty spaces against a complex enemy. Civilized war, an enemy I can find and beat, an enemy who fights by the rules! One. We'll carry on. Sir, the men have done 30 miles today. They can do more. We were many nations, had many chiefs, and each warrior could make his own decision about when and who to fight. When we fought, we fought fiercely. When we fled, it was to avoid slaughter. We had been invaded. It was a grueling campaign, covered well by the Eastern press. Over a million dollars had been spent. With little to show for the effort. I believe we found the messenger sent from Fort Wallace. You kind of kidder? What's left of him? Anymore. Lieutenant Kidder was carrying orders. Cook! Sir. Look for papers. Yes, sir. Tom, ask the man from the New York Herald to come on. All that remains of good men, sir. Lying in a regular order. In a limited circle. You find the mangled bodies of Lieutenant Kidder and his company. All individuals scalped. Skulls broken, upper arms slashed to the bone. Mr. Rivers. The Lakota slashed the arm, crippling the warrior in the next life. This man won't even be able to saddle his horse. The Indian scout. He left the scalp there beside him. He was a traitor in their eyes. Brutally hacked and disfigured so as to be beyond recognition as human beings. We shall bury them. Cavalry provisions were terrible. The men were eating rations left over from the Civil War. Soldiers suffer from inactivity, restlessness, scurvy and cholera. My husband was a strict officer. Conditions demanded it. Deserters! Deserters! Deserters, General! Push down! We have deserters. Follow those men and shoot them. Then bring none of them in alive. Send a supply wagon after them. Sound assembly. Yes, sir. You wish permission to speak, soldier? Yes, sir. Granted. I've heard talk, General. Thirty men planned to desert tonight. When we're near the route to Colorado.
wagon, Doctor. I have no sympathy with those men. They will receive no aid. Is this clear? <coughs> We're heading back to the fort. Form your men. We're returning to Fort Wallace! We're returning to Fort Wallace! <laughs> As a frontier wife and as a young woman, I admit nothing delighted me more than to be rescued by a gallant man. Adi knew this, and when he heard of cholera epidemics at Fort Riley and Fort Wallace, he simply left his regiment on the trail and rode alone almost 300 miles to me. Perhaps it was unwise, but oh, it was gallant. Informing me of that thing. You're not sick? No. What are you doing? How did you get here? I went to Fort Wallace and I didn't find you, so. So. I moved on. Went to Fort Hayes. I had to leave a few men there. I get on to Fort Harker. It's been still, no life. So I came alone. Oh. Your men? They can live without me for a time. And here I am. The beautiful Fort Riley. I didn't marry you for me to sleep in one bed and you in another. Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer. Yes. Sir, you're under arrest. You may proceed, sir. Dr. I.T. Coates. My husband was court-martialed. He was made the martyr for an unsuccessful Indian campaign. You swear that the evidence you shall give in the case now in hearing shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God? I do. Very well. Dr. Coates, when you saw the deserters, did you give them any medical attention? No, sir. For what reason did you not? As I was going to it, General Custer said to me not to go near those men at that time. I stood, of course. I obeyed his orders. How long were those men in the wagon before you gave the medical attention? I suppose two hours. What kind of medical attention did you give them? I administered opiates and made them comfortable, just as I would have done on the battlefield. What was the result of the wound received by Private Johnson? That wound was fatal. It resulted in death. When you reached camp on the night of the 7th and gave the wounded men medical attention, who instructed you or 
directed you to give attendance. General Custer. In what words or language did he give the order? He said, Doctor, my sympathies are not with those men who are wounded, but I want you to give them all necessary attention. Afterwards, did or did not the accused frequently inquire after their condition? He did, sir. What did you understand the accused to mean when he directed you not to go near the wagon containing the wounded men when they came in? I had at that time an idea that the objection was made for effect. I had an idea the general wished to make an impression on the men. Lieutenant Colonel W. W. Cook, after you arrived at Fort Wallace, with no orders, I remind the court, how many of the detachment departed Fort Hayes and started to Fort Harker with General Custer? One soldier and three officers. What authority did General Custer give you to leave Fort Wallace? Verbal or written? Verbal. Thank you, Lieutenant. Uh, may I add, sir, that between the summer of 1866 and 1867, more than 500 members of the 7th Cavalry deserted. When we fought the war against the Southerners, men who deserted during combat were shot. It was a buffalo hunt. The dismounted deserters were shot down while begging for their lives. I have never failed to relieve an imperiled friend, as he charged, or left unburied, or without having provided for the burial of a single fallen man in my command, as he charged, or finally, Ever saw a man in any strait suffer when by my authority I could relieve him as he had charged. I ask you, at your hands, gentlemen, in the name of justice, a finding of acquittal of all these charges and specifications. General George Armstrong Custer, Lieutenant Colonel, 7th U.S. Cavalry, as follows. On the first specification of the first charge, guilty. Of the second specification of the additional charge, guilty. The general was found guilty of mistreating captured deserters and of being absent from his command without authorization. He was suspended from the army for one year. Our lives had changed so much. The railroads divided the buffalo. White men shot them from trains for sport. The homesteaders' cattle grazed on our lands as we went hungry. By the age of 26, Crazy Horse was a leader of the Teton Lakota nation. He was a serious man. He never sang, he never danced, he never boasted of his victories. But he did take another man's wife, black buffalo woman, wife of no water. You see, a Lakota woman was free to choose another husband, but no water was a jealous man. Crazy Horse disappeared from the village for a time. At the age of 27, Mr. Custer was without a command. We returned to our hometown of Monroe, Michigan.
General Sheridan order you to shoot deserters without trial? What about General Hancock himself? Didn't he say shoot deserters? He took a leave to find me, knowing none would be granted. Your officers looked on it as ordinary occurrence. We are determined not to live apart again. And now we have time. We have one year with no pay. We'll survive, General. Colonel, the war has been over a long time, and I am really only a colonel. A dishonored one. which preserves the joy as well as the sadness. It is mine for time and eternity. In 1868, a treaty was signed. War stopped. The forts along the Bozeman Trail were closed. And reservations were built. We were to stay in one place now, while the white people could roam free. The Lakota were to keep forever the lands west of the Missouri River and Dakota Territory the Black Hills, and the mountains and valleys of the Little Bighorn. The white man was, by law, not allowed to enter these unceded lands without permission from the Indians. The white man brought us gifts. He gave us laws, and then he broke the law. The pioneers felt betrayed by the Treaty of 1868. They thought prime land had been given to the Indians, and now the Indians were not even using it. War erupted one more time. Nothing more than a drink of your fine General Grant? Whiskey. Yes, ma'am. May I have your autograph? Custer. My daddy says you're going to be president soon. Your daddy is a wise man. Are you little Phil Sheridan? Yes. May I have your autograph, too? Oh. You, you might also want the autograph of this gentleman, General William Tecumseh Sherman, the hero of Atlanta. Do any of you know General Custer? We are proud to know him, miss. My daddy says he is a brave Indian fighter and the army should cherish him. You, your daddy is a wise man. Thank you. They love the peacock. I do not understand him. Lord help me, I do not understand his popularity. The youngest civil war general brave Indian fighter. Half of his men were killed during battle in the South. And he barely sustained a wound. He was reckless, impulsive, dramatic, indefatigable, vain. Ulysses, what do you think of our idea? The Eastern press will devour us. The Bureau of Indian Affairs over the Department of the Interior has failed. We simply can no longer think of the Indian tribes as independent nations. 
They have to become citizens, individually responsible to the U.S. law. You want to hold them collectively, not individually responsible. I fought my civil war, and it was long and bloody. You want to repeat it? Fighting Indians instead of rebels? If we are finally to have one nation, sir. A winter campaign sounds costly and dangerous, Phil. The Indians think they're safe in the winter. But they're vulnerable. They have no grass for their ponies, and their food supply is limited. And their villages are virtually immobile. How many plans? We swing three swords at the winter camps along the Washita and the South Canadian River Valley. I launch one column eastward down the South Canadian. A second column will operate southward toward the Antelope Hills and the head of the Red River. These two columns will act as beaters in for our third and strongest column, the 7th Cavalry. Who will lead the 7th? We want Custer. Custer. He's been suspended from duty. Reinstate him, Ulysses. No, 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 no. He'll charge his men into some sleeping village and commit slaughter. I have always known you as a man who didn't turn back or stop until the thing intended was accomplished. The telegram arrived as we dined with friends. It read, General G.A. Custer, Monroe, Michigan. General Sherman, Sully, and myself, and nearly all the officers of your regiment have asked for you. And I hope that the application will be successful. Can you come at once? Signed, General Philip Sheridan. I'll miss you, Colonels. I have been reprimanded. And now I return a humble man. I need a victory. Molly, the train will not wait for you. I'll have you with me before long. I will come when the Seventh Cavalry has had its victory. Top? Just before you arrived, Cormorant, you missed it. Well, I couldn't hit the side of a barn door. <laughs> Sheridan asked for me. We're glad to have you back, sir. Right. 
Sherman and Sheridan both. They asked that I return. They need me. said it wanted peace. We were given lands. We were to have them for as long as the buffalo roams. When the buffalo was gone, we were to give up our ways and begin to live like the white men. Chief Red Cloud told us how the white men lived. You must put away the wisdom of your fathers, he said. You must lay up food and forget the hungry. When your house is built, your storeroom filled, look for a neighbor and seize all he has. Our land for as long as the buffalo roams. By a year's time, the white man broke the promise. Orders from General Sully, sir. Is that all, sir? Yes, sir. At ease. <laughs> so, how is General Sully? He has no business commanding my expedition. I don't know what Grant was thinking, giving the seventh to him. I don't think he'll last long now that you're back. Besides, you have such natural leadership qualities. Oh, and don't you forget it, little brother. <laughs> think you should have been the general? I didn't need to be general. I won all the medals. <laughs> Well, I understand that you've been under arrest a few times. It's uh, drinking. Mm. You promised Libby. I'll be better now that you're back. <laughs> well, who's with us? Where? And Yates? Cook is, of course, delighted that you're back. He wants to know if you saw his darling Diana in Monroe. Still smitten? Benteen is no friend. He calls us the Custer clan. And so we are. Our mother and father. Fine, fine. Nevin is sickly. And Boston, Boston is growing. He's... He's a man now. And Margaret? A beauty. General Custer! Permission to enter, sir? Come in. Gentlemen, the 7th Cavalry is a disgrace. The men are depleted and demoralized. And it will be our job to bring them back to fighting condition. Lieutenant Cook, I want three columns sent out in search of Indian encampments. When, sir? Tonight. By the end of the week, we shall all of us march to the Medicine Lodge Creek and return here. Maybe then we will be prepared for the duty that awaits us. Are these General Sully's orders, sir? They will be. Captain Weir. Yes, sir. You will collect all the men's horses and divide them according to color. I want each company on its own color horse. It will be an impressive sight. Napoleon did it. Yes, sir. Cook! Can the band play Gary Owen? No, sir. I want to hear it by tomorrow night. Yes, sir. Attention! 
Right. Press. Ready. Front. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eyes. Right. husband was called many things. Brave soldier, hard taskmaster, fearless, reckless. He was all of those things, and his men were proud to follow in his charge. The 7th Cavalry longed for a war record of its own. The regiment moved deeper into uncharted territory.
If you wish, for the record. Well, for General Grant. Proceed south in the direction of the Antelope Hills, then toward the Washita River, the supposed seat of the hostile tribes. Destroy their village and capture the ponies, kill or hang all warriors, and bring back all women and children. Yes, sir. The winter of 1868. The Cheyenne camped on the Washita River. Oh, my, it was a beautiful place. My husband had waited for his victory. He was ready. Our chief, Black Kettle, flew an American flag over his teepee. The Commissioner of Indian Affairs had told him it would keep us safe. Music woke me up. Soldier. What should we do about Major Elliott, sir? He rode off with 15 men. Has not been seen since. That's unfortunate. But we have Indians approaching, and I intend to save my wounded. Recall your men. We're moving out, Captain. We're deserting, Major Elliott? Recall your men!
Washita was a great victory for my husband. Fifty-one lodges were destroyed, fifty-three women and children were taken prisoner, and a hundred and three Indian warriors were killed. Eleven of our warriors died, and we remember their names. The rest of our dead were women and children. It was always about the land. The land divided us. We both wanted it. Enter. Enter. I feel it's my duty to inform you that the men are in an ugly mood. They feel you left the field without ascertaining the condition of Major Elliot. Is that also your belief, Captain? It is. I will not be chastised by you. I will not tolerate insubordination. Let a man make such an accusation and I will horsewhip him within an inch of his life! You're dismissed! Defend them to me, sir. I will see you again, Mr. Benteen. Supply became a holding place for many Cheyenne women and children. Miotzi was my cousin. She was captured by the soldiers. blonde-haired child, a girl named Yellowbird, Custer's child. So says my family history. I never saw the child. She died at one year. If it were true, then this made Custer my relative, in a way. Custer came to our camp in the lodge of the medicine arrow keeper. He was offered the pipe. I come for peace. I do not come for war. The white man wants to live in peace with the Cheyenne. We have learned that you have white 
captives. I wish the chief to return the women. Also, I wish that the Cheyenne return to their reservation. I keep my captives. I keep your men until the women are released. Nestes, Nestes, Miha, Whoa. He says that if you break this peace with the Cheyenne and you follow them, you and all your soldiers will be killed. my words. I will not hunt the Cheyenne. And so it was agreed. Custer held three of our chiefs captive. For their freedom, we would trade two captured white women the next day. In those times, a white woman was told that it was better to kill herself than be taken captive by us. Our warriors felt the same. I know so little about them. I think in the end, we will know nothing. Maybe that's best. Not for me. I want to know what the... Tell me. What do they think the world is? Suddenly we Europeans arrive, we... We bring horses and guns and wagons, we build houses, we run trains across the land. What do they think of us? What was their world like before we became such a part of it? Or do they think of these things? Are they able to? What do they think of you? I am a blue coat. I speak with forked tongue. <laughs> they think I'm very handsome. So I understand. And what do you think of them? Are they beautiful? Are the women beautiful to you? You are the most beautiful woman in the world. And I know a lot about the world. After you left for Fort Dodge, I went and stayed at my father's house in Monroe. I would sit and look out the window remember that Custer boy would walk back and forth in front of my gate courting me obsessively I remember that Custer boy fresh out of West Point they're drunk. Horribly drunk. Stood outside your gate and hollered your name. Until my brothers came and dragged me away. Shameful. I haven't had a drink since. No. It was shameful how you wooed me. I was meant to do it. And there is nothing I meant to do. But I will not attempt, even if it's 
If what? Even if I'm wrong. We lit the prairie on fire. Now, of course, we know fires did not stop the white man. But then we lit the tall grass on fire to slow the blue coats. If they tried to chase us. Untie them. Tell them they can go. Tell them that when the Cheyenne return to the reservation, then they will be free men. The kids who are in the Zeit so it's it. They are in them. Peter, some more money. Okay, it's nasty. Stop away from me. What did he say? He says they are free men now. Take them back to our camp. The white captives were returned. Our chiefs were not returned. They were killed by the blue coats. We moved west. Now we've been closer to our friends, the Lakota. Red Cloud went to meet with President Ulysses S. Grant. Red Cloud was a peace chief. He had opposed the white man, but now something had changed in him. He had seen the cities, the machines, the number of people. He saw the inevitability of the white men. We welcome Chief Red Cloud of the Oglala Nation. He came here to witness the ways of our people. We invite him to hear our words and recognize the sincerity of our promises. Oh, sit, sit. Sir. I come from where the sun sets. You were raised on chairs. I want to sit as I sit where the sun sets. Tungashila Yapiki Okiakayo. Lakota Oyankiki. I had two mountains in the Dakotas. I want no roads there. I asked that he remove Fort Fetterman. Fort Fetterman must remain. 
Fort Fetterman, uh, Yapikihi, uh, Tokone, Inahintelo. As a protection for Indians and whites alike. I am not at heart an aggressive expansionist. I do not believe in it. What I do believe in is one nation for all. Half a million of my people died recently for one nation. Can Chief Red Cloud control his warriors? Can he keep peace? Whose voice was heard first in this land? It was the red people who used to bow. Our nation is melting like the snow on the sides of the hills when the sun is warm. While your people are like the blades of grass in springtime when summer is coming. You tell him this very directly. Survival is victory, Chief Red Cloud. You can't stop us now. You can only survive among us. This is your land. Lamakoche Kinetawa Yellow. Why these lines? Boundaries. Where the land ends. It is lies. Americans invaded our sacred Black Hills. I came to the Northern Cheyenne when their reservation was in the Black Hills country. But white men found gold there, so the Indians had to move out. The Cheyenne were told that they had to go to another reservation. But not many of them moved. They said it was no use, as the white men might want that reservation too. The army did not invade the Black Hills. They went in to try to stop the flow of settlers. Back east, the banking houses failed. The stock market crashed. Farm prices plummeted during the worst grasshopper plague in history. 20% of the city's labor forces were unemployed. Nice talk. There were more people in jail than any other time in the history of the nation. Homeless tramps roamed the country. The nation needed expansion to the West. Oh, oh, oh. I 
that was my animal, boys. <laughs> what? Big, big man. Shoot. 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 I'm brave for you. Braver just to reach out. Touch an enemy. Count coup. <laughs> Bloody knife, my friend. Why are you not out here living like a real Indian? Kagi. It is finished. Is it? It is time to live like the white man. Progress. Crazy Horse had this to say about those treaties which he never signed. One does not sell the land upon which all living things walk. gave up all hope of ever living peacefully with the white man. President Grant found himself caught on the horns of a dilemma. Prospectors and settlers clamored for protection as they moved into the Black Hills. The tide was deep, the migration inevitable. They will not cede the Black Hills territory. But they have broken the treaty themselves by attacking the settlers. Trespassers. In our minds, sir, they started it. So we issue an ultimatum. All Indians must report to their agencies by January 31st, 1876, or be considered hostile. story that before the great battle, Crazy Horse rode a long ways to the burial scaffold of his three-year-old daughter. She had died of cholera. One more gift from the white man. Crazy Horse stayed with his child for three days and three nights. And when the three days were done, he painted red lightning on his face and white hailstones on his body. And he tied a brown pebble behind his ear. For this, the warrior in his vision had told him to do.
coup. must report to their agencies by January 31st. If this request is not complied with, if the Indians do not come in, the Commission of Indian Affairs will turn the problem of the hostiles over to the War Department, who will initiate a campaign aimed at containing the hostiles and returning them to the reservation and to the jurisdiction of the United States of America. And then we're all sons of bitches. Military operations may be commenced whenever, in the opinion of the War Department, such action becomes necessary. And sometime this winter, it will become necessary. Agreed. We've been killing Indians for hundreds of years. Let's get the business over with. I want Custer to head the expedition. We need one great bloody battle. He'll guarantee one. began to long for a separate America. The reservation system was a terrible sadness. I remember them. The men drank. The women cried. The children went to school. As Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull resisted, so did many others. The number of hostiles grew. Why Mary loves the lamb, you know, lamb, you know, lamb, you know. Why Mary loves the lamb, you know, the teacher did reply. Mary had a little lamb, little lamb. I was a young woman that winter. I had come to the camp of Crazy Horse after my village was attacked and burned. Crazy Horse took us with him. Together we traveled north to join Sitting Bull. The tribal nations grew larger and larger while we traveled from place to place as the grass came up. Minikonju, Papa, Sihasapa, Arapaho, Santi, Brule, Sansark. 
The white men brought us together. We had moved to Fort Lincoln in Dakota Territory. In Washington, the Grant administration was plagued by one scandal after another. Secretary of War Belknap resigned under accusations of misconduct in appointing the fort traders. My husband was summoned to the Capitol to testify at the impeachment hearings. I trust to give more attention to Secretary Belknap in Washington than you did here. Hmm? When the secretary visited, you left him alone in the house and went to the chicken coop by yourself. I was right then. I'm right now. I had to be hostess that day, and poor Tom had to play host. Maybe you owed him the dignity of a military visit? He is not a fellow officer. He is a liar and a thief. And that is what you will testify to? In so many words. It's time to go. Be careful what you say, Audie. Don't make us entirely unwelcome in Washington. Do you think we might want a home there one day? I think you are a man of many talents who might serve his country in greater ways. I would like to be head of Indian Affairs. You should let it be known. First, I intend to reunite the entire 7th Cavalry with a great expedition. Then we'll see. Committee investigation into the activities of Secretary of War William Bell. I understand. In your own words, why don't you tell us about the situation in your area since the appointment of post traders was placed into the hands of the Secretary of War? <clears throat> the immediate result of this was an increased cost of living at the frontier posts, and it came out of the pockets of the officers and then the men. Elaborate, please. Well, <clears throat> prices became exorbitant. We were, uh, we were pressed to purchase our necessities elsewhere. It was then that the post trader wrote a complaint to the War Department saying we must be forced to buy from him. And that claim was upheld by Secretary Belknap. I had discussed these offenses with the secretary at one point. He had told me, you must not believe all you hear. My opinion is that Secretary Belknap shared in the profits of the trading posts as payment for the appointments. What about the rumors that the president's own brother took paint? I'm under the impression that Orville Grant likewise shared in the profits. Thank you, General. I would like to say one more thing, Congressman. Yes? The Indian agents of the Department of the Interior perpetuate one travesty after another against the reservation Indian. An Indian can well expect to find sour meat, weighted flour, and bad coffee in his gratuities. These goods are not what Congress, I believe, intended to be the Indian share. In my opinion, the Bureau of Indian Affairs should be under the auspices of the Army, as it was prior to 1849. Thank you, General. I saved your life after you were court-martialed. You never would have found your way back into this man's army, sir, if I hadn't interceded for you. And this is how you repay me. I had to testify. I was summoned by Congress. You didn't stop at testifying. Where do you assume the authority to question the government Indian policy, Colonel? 
begging the general's pardon, sir. But this government has no Indian policy. As we all know, the reservations are a disgrace. If I were an Indian, I would prefer to live free and wild than as one of those surviving without pride on handouts. And you, sir, would be considered hostile. General Sherman, I have been here for two weeks, and President Grant won't see me. I have requested from the adjutant of the Army permission to join my regiment. You have my permission. And I've ordered three companies of the 7th to the Dakotas from the south. Train and reorganize your men. But I am no longer sure that you will be leading the column. I suspect that is a directive from President Grant. The president is the commander-in-chief. You will take orders, and you will not talk to the press. You're still a soldier. My husband reported to his immediate superior, General Alfred Terry. You're no longer to lead the expedition. I am. Why don't you sit down, Armstrong? And the 7th? Major Reno has asked to command the 7th Cavalry. Major Reno? Major Reno has never fought the Indians. Armstrong, you're not even to go. You're to remain behind. Does anyone know what lies out there, beyond the cities and the newspapers? Does anyone know the thin line that separates the Indian from the soldier the way I do? I could be an Indian. I can find them. The president is crucifying me. Intercede for me. I'm strong. I appeal to you as a soldier to spare me the humiliation of seeing my regiment March to meet the enemy, and I not share in its dangers. This is it. My friends at the New York Herald. Mr. Grant has abused the power of the presidency in his removal of General Custer. He has assumed the autocracy of an American Caesar. Politics, Ulysses. They are crucifying me. Reinstate him. Again. Shift to my arm and dance like a woman. Thank you. It's still stinging and having the regiment take you away. Mm. Well, at least it wasn't giving me a custom. The finest dancer here. That man has had an amazing succession of ups and downs. Mm. Custer's luck. Now you should have realized by now, Major. Custer's problems never hold him down long. He's plotting his new book on. Sure, his next success after my lie on the plains. You mean my life on the plains? Uh, yes, my error. Well, I guess he's learned his lesson for good now. Adrian. 
Custer has made a career out of learning all the wrong lessons. Armstrong, Libby, shall we dance? Staring a hole through you. Well, he was the commander of the 7th Cavalry for a few weeks, where I should be. He wishes me far away. Don't be silly. I'll be far away, all right. I'll have my own command. I'll beat them all. swing three swords at the hostels. Gibbons column from the west, General Crook from the south, and us from the east. Our scouts inform us that hundreds of young Sioux and Cheyenne braves have left the reservation to join Sitting Bull somewhere in this area. Rosebud Valley, difficult terrain. Armstrong? Many of these braves have repeating rifles, which they bought from the Indian traders. My concern is our own ammunition. My ordnance officer tells me these copper-cased cartridges are too soft. He says they corrode. They tend to jam the Springfield ejector after three shots. I know. That is why my officers and I carry our own rifles and brass casings at our own expense. What's the army trying to do to us? Sir, there is no time to think about that now. Terry has no business leading this expedition. Why did they pass me over? You are the man they need most. In ten years, I have not received a promotion. There is not enough meat here for all of us. I have been a soldier for 15 years, and I cannot afford to feed my family. Dear Lord, we thank you for the bounty of our table and the beauty of our home. Thank you for giving us beloved family, Brother Boston, our nephew, Audie Reed, Lieutenant Cook, and our dear sister, Maggie. Amen. 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 Let us have a cheer. Yes. <laughs> to General Custer, the once and future leader of the 7th Cavalry. You're here. I do a short journey and a safe return. Safe return. Here, here. Ta -ta. Is to a star or a coffin. And I'll be there right beside you. And I. And I. 
and I. summer expedition had come. Some rejoiced. Our women's hearts fell. It was a glorious, sad time. My husband again had field command of the 7th Cavalry, but General Terry retained command of the expedition. Kelly! for the first night and the men were paid. Some of the wives were privileged to come along until the next morning's departure. I was happy to be with my husband for one more day, even though I bore a premonition that I never had known before. that the Sioux will sit still and wait for us. The Rosebud? Close. From Washington. A gift. Ah. <laughs> World's best scout. I was a very young chief. In the Great War, the Civil War between the states, I had 11 horses shot down from under me. I killed my first man. I hunted him like an antelope. It was hard. I took his sword, and on it it said, Draw me not without provocation. Sheed me not without honor. Lady Scars. No scars. When the son of the morning star is a great father, you will all come to Washington, and I will build my friend Bloody Knife a great house, and all the women and children will have plenty to eat and want nothing. 
Custer never died. <laughs> Custer lived forever. <laughs> Only dream. So bad? Your scalp. You're dead. Only a dream. Yes. Oh. Maybe this will be the last one. soldier's wife. By the spring of 1876, we were considered hostile. Every spring before, people would leave the reservations to hunt. But this spring, if we left, there would be no going back. Sitting Bull said, return to me. Come to the Rosebud and we'll dance and sing and hunt. Some of us had not seen a buffalo in more than a year. Sitting Bull, Sitting Bull, his name struck terror into the hearts of the white men. And by now, no one hated the white men more.
He had touched a slain Crow Indian with a coup stick at age 14. It is said that he could count 63 coups by this dreadful summer. He was fearless. He was wise. Oh, called for a sun dance, and he sacrificed. He had 50 slices of flesh cut from each arm. He went without food or sleep for three days. On the third day, he had a vision. The blue coats will fall into our camp. Like so many locusts, they will die. General, it's, it's to be Reno's reconnaissance. Terry's sending Reno. Don't worry, Artie. Reno couldn't find Indians on a reservation. He's to go south to the mouth of the Little Powder. Then he will cross to the Mitzvah and the Tongue, descend the Tongue, and join up again with us at the Yellowstone. Major Reno will be sent out. Congratulations. I'm to take your guide and eight of your Indian scouts. You'll need them. One day we're going to have to invade Mexico and make her ours. How would you rationalize such a move, General? They call it manifest destiny. <laughs> manifest destiny. The inevitable right of those who have to rule over those who have not. What will history think of our small conceit? What do you think, Ulysses? I think nations like individuals are responsible for their transgressions. During the Southern Rebellion, it seemed to me the beginning of an answer to let us have peace. I hope we're on the eve of a new harmony. It's late. You did this in positive defiance of my orders. I am sorry, sir, but I thought that we might discover a trail. I know what you thought. All right. Major Reno, by crossing the Tongue River and disobeying his orders, has discovered a trail that leads up the Rosebud and theoretically crosses the Wolf Mountains. The size of the trail confirms the Indian agent's reports that there are probably a thousand warriors traveling with Sitting Bull and that they've... Excuse affected... me, Major Reno. If you had more experience in the territories, you would have learned there are no greater liars than Indian agents. My experience... Silence! Both of you. Now, General Custer, your column will march south along the river to a position well east of the Indians. 
You will then strike west, down the little Bighorn Valley, constantly feeling to your left to make sure the Indians have not already made their escape to the east or the south. I will be riding with Colonel Gibbon along the Yellowstone, to the Bighorn and then to the little Bighorn. We will shut the north door. If Mr. Reno hasn't tipped our hand. No Indian saw my troops. How can you be so sure, Major? If you were going to disobey your orders so thoroughly, you might have at least followed your trail far enough to give me some notion as to where the Indians are. We have a perfectly good Major notion. Reno. You will be departing with General Custer in the morning. You will be under his command. Thank you, that's all. I want you to explore the upper reaches of Tullock's Creek. Do you want Gibbon's 2nd Cavalry and the Gatling guns? The guns will only impede my march. I want no supply wagons. We'll take pack mules and I need no extra soldiers. The 7th Cavalry can stand up against anything we might run across. I'll send you written orders in the morning. Don't be greedy, Custer. Wait for us. No, I won't. No bugle call beyond this point. Fifteen days rations. Heart attack, coffee, and sugar. Twelve days rations. Each man needs 100 rounds carbine, 25 rounds pistol ammunition. Extra forage for the horses. Sabers will be stowed and left. And extra salt. We may end up eating horse flesh. Armstrong? Sir. I knew you would still be up. May I? Come in. Warm. June weather. Riding Livy? Yes, sir. May I mail it for you? I will leave it with you in the morning. Thank you. We should be in Philadelphia for the centennial celebration. Well, sir, maybe by the 4th of July we can send the country a birthday present. Armstrong. I want you to use your own judgment and do as you think best if you should strike the trail. And whatever you do, Custer, hold on to your wounded.
badlands of Montana were especially hot and punishing that summer. By the third week in June, the 7th Cavalry was a month out of Fort Lincoln. Hold your tongue, soldier. Yes, sir. The last letter the general wrote to me read, I am now going to take up the trail where the scouting party turned back. I feel hopeful of accomplishing great results. I will move directly up the valley of the Rosebud. Colonel Gibbons' command and General Terry will proceed up the Bighorn as fast as they can go. We take no tents and desire none. I hope to have a good result to send you by the next mail. General. to meet well over a thousand warriors. Does anyone have any thoughts or advice? I, for one, am sorry you did not take the second cavalry off. I think we will regret not having them. I could not include them in our march. We are the 7th Cavalry. We will pursue the Indians until we find them. And with your loyalty and cooperation, we can do just that. Thank you, gentlemen. Sleep well. Does the general seem uh, different to you? Well, sir, I've never seen him quite so charitable at an officer's call. Yes. That's what worries me.
fight like bulls. Whites run like women. How many Indians, Buddy Knight? Tell him. our rosebud cap and moved toward the little pecan. There was more Indians traveling then than I ever saw anywhere else before or since. The path we left was wide and deep. Over the mountains. We followed the trail. Don't we first got Tullock's Creek? No. How do you... We're after containment, not a battle. Is that what you would do? Yes. Maybe you should have been the general. I didn't have to be the general. I won all the medals. Buddy, you don't have to go after them by yourself. Maybe I do. Follow the trail. General? General? The scouts have returned. They say the Indian trail crosses the divide. Have the Indians scattered? No. I want you to send the scouts ahead to that high point they have told us about? Yes, sir. See if they can spot the camp from there. We will follow. Tomorrow, sir? Tonight. on the plains that taught my husband to anticipate the Indians' moves. Don't let them scatter. Stay close. Attack at dawn. I guess we can get through them all in one day. Once we find the hostiles, you scouts are free to leave. You don't have to fight. Plenty good soup ponies. You gather those ponies. Good day, Mr. General. Giovanni Martini, order today. A Scott say it is possible to see the village. Sir, 
thought I'd suggest you give orders. There be no fires. If I can see our camp from here, the Indians can see it too. Where do I find these hostiles? Off to the western horizon, sir. Beyond the far bluff is the valley of the Little Big Horn. The village is there. I don't see it. It's there, General. The scouts tell me they see a huge pony herd on the far western bluff. They say it looks like worms in the grass. Hello, 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 I don't see it. Today and attack tomorrow at dawn. Audie, that box of hard tech that Captain Yates' company lost on the trail. Well, Sergeant Curtis went back there and there were several hostiles rifling through it. And well, we've been spotted. First sergeant! Assembly! Jump at a sound officer's call! Call the assembly! Sitting Bull prayed for us that day. High above our camp on the little bighorn. It was a large camp, the largest I ever saw in my life. The village stretched for three miles along the river. I think there were 10,000 Indians. We were to stay at the camp but one night and then go the next day. We were moving when long hair attacked us. He must have been surprised. had led our men against General Crook earlier. That victory gave our warriors great courage. We were strong. We were ready. We had to fight. The sun was hot that day. I believe there were clouds. I know there was no rain. Back is the pack train now. Two, three miles. You will take your battalion and diverge at a left oblique of about 45 degrees. You will sweep everything you see before you, pitch into anything you might come across. Haven't we better keep the regiment together, General? If this camp is as big as they say, we're going to need every man we've got. You have your orders. General, I'm not clear about this. How much of an area do you want me to scout? You heard me, Captain! Sweep the area! <laughs> Battalion left oblique! Oblique! <laughs> <laughs> 
Send a man at the canteen with supplementary orders. Tell the captain that if he finds nothing, he is to go to the second line of bluffs. Also, he is to keep at least one mounted officer with a command of five or six men well in advance of the detachment. Move! Yes, sir. Scouts come across a fancy burial lodge. They say they won't go past it. You better talk to them. One side and let the soldiers pass you in the charge. If any man of you is not brave, I will take away his weapons and make a woman of him. Tell Jesu, Mr. Hall, Ohio Cotech, the bear show. Because I guess that the whole bus show, Jesu, Mark. What did he say? He says that if you do the same thing to all your frightened soldiers, it's going to take a long time. General! Where go, you engines, General? Running like the devil. Go to Major Reno. Say the village is just above us and running away. He is to cross the river, move forward at as rapid a gate as he deems prudent. He'll be supported by the whole command. Yes, sir. I go gather those ponies. Go with Reno. Friend, today you and I go home by a road we do not know. And so my husband divided his regiment. Major Reno and his men were sent across the river. Captain Benteen led a reconnaissance to the southeast. Both failed him. night march men and horses exhausted nothing oh god it's a waste of time if there are indians in this valley they're there
Bugler, sound the charge. This is it, boys. Somewhere past the middle of the forenoon, nobody was thinking of any battle coming. A few women were taking down their lodges, just getting ready for the move on down the valley that day. Right there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, boys. All right, boys. We 
got him napping. Yeah. Let's finish this business and return home to our station. Yeah. Yeah. gathered the old people and the women and the children. He cried to his warriors. He said, take courage. It is a good day to die. The blue coats attacked the Hunk Papa circle at the end of the village, a good two miles from our Cheyenne camp. In all camps, there was great excitement. Warriors kept going, going, going. I wanted to go too. Anger was our best weapon that day. rode through the Civil War leading 11 charges. He rode through the plains and never called a retreat. He never asked a soldier to do anything he would not do himself. I think, what was it like for him at the end?
Cade, Martini. Oh, there you are. Where is Custer? A three mile up. And the hostiles? Come on. The horse. The hostiles. The Indians. Oh, they be shkada, darling. Well, the mule train has fallen behind. If he wants me to hurry to him, how does he expect that I bring packs? Uh, if I'm to be of any service to him, I think I'd better wait for the packs.
One group of soldiers was trapped on top of a hill. But most warriors were downriver battling high at sea. position. Captain, permission to go to the sound of the firing, sir! Permission denied. This is the ground, dog chase, men! It is live or die! Big rifle pits, now! Damn it, it's crazy!
the first steamer that returned from the Yellowstone had brought the letters from my husband. I was to join him for the 4th of July. We were going to celebrate the 100th birthday of the United States. him, even though his hair was short and his face dirty. A Lakota warrior came to cut him. The Cheyenne women pleaded for Custer. They said he was a relative, the husband of Meotzi. So the warrior only took a fingertip. The women... They punctured his ears with their sewing awls. They did this so that he would hear better. He had promised never again to make war on the Cheyennes. And we had promised his death if he did. He forgot his promise. He did not remember our words. In the next life, he should hear us better. People traveled with Crazy Horse, first into the Bighorn Mountains, and then down into the Powder River country. We froze. We starved. The white men kept coming. Indian women seem to have known for days. We waited for the news. For a word. Then it came. Sunday, June the 25th, 1876. General George Armstrong Custer and at or near 265 members of his regiment were killed in battle with hostile Indian tribes at the Little Bighorn River. <laughs> ask Mrs. Custer that you will accompany us as we tell the other wives. Will you hand me my shawl, please? Leave now. 
hope you're not in the army anymore. Six months after the battle, Crazy Horse and we who were with him surrendered. Crazy Horse was hostile. He was dangerous. He was feared. As a child, he had a vision. He saw a warrior riding out from the sun. The warrior carried no scalps. He feared nothing. He'd felt destined to protect his people from the white men. But in the end, he saw he would die. He would be unable to defend himself. His arms held by one of his own people. surrendered in 1881. In 1890, some called for a ghost dance. We can pray back the buffalo, they said. We can dance back our lives. We danced, and we danced, and we danced. One cold dawn, Indian police killed Sitting Bull and his son. Soon after, the last of the ghost dancers were massacred at a place called Wounded Knee. And then the Plains Indian Wars were over.